welcome everyone uh, to this selective webinar, which might be, if I'm correctly informed, uh, one of the or maybe the last uh, webinar uh, from the selective side uh, for 2023. Uh, with the nice title PAB 2.0 question mark, uh, net zero sector pathways and portfolio applications. Um, on the behalf of Selective, uh, thank you all for, for being with us today and taking the time, uh, which we want to use as, as good as possible to explore this topic that uh, we think is quite timely uh, and interesting at the same time. Um, my name is Florian Müller. I'm part of the strategic initiatives team over here at Selective. Uh, we work on all things ESG from a, a strategic point of view, meaning um, how do we need to position Selective in terms of our expertise, our products, our services to provide at the end of the day the best possible uh, experience uh, to our client base. And part of that work is translating emerging trends uh, and topics um, in the in the larger ESG market uh, into uh, a context that, that we can leverage with our clients, um, like today's topic, um, which is net zero sector pathways. Um, before we get going, just one housekeeping item, you can uh, use the Q&A function throughout the session to, to post your questions as they arise. Um, we will allocate time at the end of the webinar to uh, to address all of them, uh, hopefully. So let's get started. <clears throat> what are we aiming for today? Um, I basically like each and every one of you to to kind of walk away from this session with with the following three takeaways. Um, number one, understand what sectoral pathways are and why they are important already or uh, becoming increasingly so. Um, number two, understand the data landscape on a high level yeah, and uh, be familiar with uh, key outputs uh, of one model that we have been uh, playing around with at Selective, namely the OECM, which stands for One Earth Climate Model. And number three, um, the fun stuff, understand the use cases. What can we do with this data, specifically in a portfolio application context? Um, and what are maybe some of the limitations that we have found in, you know, in our in our work? So starting out uh, with the first takeaway, what are sector pathways? Um, a pathway in general is the evolution of one variable over time. Yeah? And in our specific case here, uh, this variable of interest is CO2 emissions or GHG emissions, depending on you know, uh, what kind of model uh, you are looking at. Pathways answer the question, what needs to happen in order to uh, achieve a specific goal? Yeah? And when does it need to happen? So in our case, uh, what does each sector have to contribute in order to reach net zero emissions by 2050, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees or two degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial uh, levels. Again, depending on what kind of uh, model and scenario you are looking at. So pathways do two things. They um, provide a benchmark for both the pace of decarbonization that is required and also the timing of emissions reductions. Um, and you can see uh, some exemplary pathways uh, on the left here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, uh, as I said in the beginning, a pathway in general is just the evolution of one variable. Now, obviously there could be a, a Florian Mueller or a selective pathway. Yeah, and I could draw whatever line uh, kind of looks good to me. The stuff that we are talking about today uh, is obviously backed by by uh, by serious science, yeah, um, which distinguishes uh, the pathways that we are looking at from, you know, my personal or uh, the selective pathway. Uh, in any case, so um, before we move on, maybe um, this is a good time to clarify also some of the common terms. Uh, that are often used and popping up in, in the context of pathways, right? Um, pathways are derived uh, from a combination uh, of a scenario, 
um, and a model, yeah. And sometimes, uh, you know, the, the the terms pathway and scenario are used kind of interchangeably, but I we think it's important to kind of highlight the distinction. So a scenario is a certain narrative about the future. Yeah, what can happen uh, is basically the question that it answers, um, and this narrative about the future is translated into assumptions. For example, how does GDP evol uh, evolve over time? How does population growth evolve? Or how does the carbon price behave? How fast are we um, moving on from uh, combustion engines, for example? Yeah, These are all assumptions that uh, are included in a scenario. And these assumptions are basically fed into a, into a model um, and this model basically characterizes how um, different elements of the economy, our ecosystems, the energy systems, and other systems uh, interact. Yeah. So, so these interactions are specified by the model itself. Um, the emissions pathway uh, that we are looking at at the end is the outcome or the output of such a model and such a scenario. Um, but at the at the same time, the pathway uh, is part of a scenario itself, right? It's it it sounds slightly contradicting, maybe, um, but since it's also uh, based on let's say uh, a specific scenario, the pathway you're looking at, which is at the end just one variable, is also um, in some sense a scenario or a representation of a scenario. Um, and what's quite uh, maybe the last thing that I. I would add here is that scenarios are often, um, you know, taken as predictions, which is not the case. Yeah. So um, scenarios are really just a narrative. And again, you know, I could translate my earlier example. There could be a selective or Florian Mueller narrative about many of those things. Um, but obviously, um, the scenarios we are looking at are uh, um, grounded in, uh, in in science, yeah? So it's quite important to, to keep in mind throughout the webinar that when we talk about certain scenarios, um, these are uh, not predictions of what will actually happen in the future. So on the growing importance of sector pathways, um, you can see on the slides a couple of um, excerpts from uh, reports that came out recently, um, you know, reports that we read and that kind of um, uh, were our starting point to say this is a is an interesting topic that you know is gaining a lot of attention from um, industry alliances where you know a lot of our clients and investors uh, across the globe gather to to you know advance these topics, and I don't want to. Uh, go through each and every quote, but I've highlighted a couple of sections that um, basically describe what kind of use cases are envisioned uh, for sector pathways in these reports or by these by these industry alliances. And I think uh, given the background of, of everyone on the webinar, that kind of draws a very uh, neat picture of why sector pathways can become uh, actually uh, quite an important data point uh, in the financial markets. Yeah. So if we start on the top left, you can see that uh, sector pathways inform how to align portfolios to not uh, to net zero. Yeah. That's basically uh, one of the elements that we will also look at uh, today in the application section. Uh, on top of that, they can form a basis for engagement. Another big element, I think, um, in the in the uh, responsible uh, investment community. Um, something that we're we're not gonna get into uh, detail uh, about today, but uh, nonetheless something that is a very important ingredient for I think a lot of a lot of institutions out there. Um, moving on to the next uh, report and quote bottom left, uh, they can be used for the steering of investment portfolios. Yeah, that is um, related to the first point. Not only do they inform how to align portfolios to net zero but they also inform our decisions in steering portfolios uh, along the way, basically. Yeah? Um, and last but not least, maybe a, a slight reiteration um, uh, of a previous point, stewardship and engagement are, are highlighted by the IIGCC uh, in a recent report. So um, the applications are kind of broad and along the dimensions um, that, that I think most people are familiar with in portfolio construction, 
portfolio steering, but also uh, stewardship and engagement. Yeah. <clears throat> um, quick overview on the data landscape. Um, if you if you run a quick Google search on uh, sectoral pathways, um, you might quickly get the impression that we are actually spoiled for choice. Um, and I've uh, you know tried to summarize the the main uh, providers of these of these pathways and along with pathways also models and scenarios uh, on this slide. Um, we're obviously not, you know, the experts and climate uh, scientists um, on on each and every one of these models. Um, as we are happy to, you know, to share the slides after the the webinar with everyone who's interested, we've included the starting point in the form of a link here for for each and every one of you to uh, explore these on your own, uh, because. Um, the scenario choice or the model choice has obvious uh, implications on you know on the results you're going to get, um, and that's maybe uh, you know a topic for another webinar. Um, there are also great reports out there uh, by GFANS, for example, on you know what investors should keep in mind when they when they utilize sector pathway data, also in terms of model choice uh, and scenario choice. Um, but this is just meant to, to provide you a quick overview. So we have uh, the International Energy Agency, uh, which is, I think, the most widely known uh, provider of these, of these data points, um, um, most importantly through their World Energy Outlook that they publish on an annual basis and which usually um, makes its way into you know, uh, uh, news and, and media um, Quite quite well in the in the past couple of years, um, so they you know the International Energy Agency has uh, two different scenarios that that uh, would yield to below two degrees world, um, and as part or you know combining these scenarios with their models, um, they also provide global and regional pathways uh, for various for various sectors. Yeah. Um, then we have NGFS, the Network of Central Banks and Supervisors for Cleaning the Financial System, um, also um, becoming increasingly uh, popular, I think. Um, they have a very broad uh, choice of scenarios. I think the, the number I put on the slide here for is, might even be outdated as I think they added uh, another scenario recently. And they structure the scenario across three categories, yeah? Uh, an orderly transition, a disorderly transition, and a hothouse world. So uh, this gives you also an impression of, you know, the important choices you uh, would kind of have to, to make when you consider certain scenarios. Uh, scenarios can be different and they can model uh, very different outcomes. Um, and NGFS is, is really trying to provide uh, different scenarios across all of these. Um, and then on top of that, they provide three different models for each scenario. So there's uh, a huge matrix of, of possible choices. Yeah, and it's definitely a very interesting uh, uh, read uh, to, to just explore their website and their data explorer um, and, and dive into, into all these options a little bit more. Um, within the European Union, there's the uh, uh, Joint Research Center um, located within the, the Commission. Yeah, uh, Similar to the International Energy Agency, they also publish a global energy and climate outlook. And to do so, they have developed a, a, a model of their own, also with two different below two degree scenarios. Um, and last but not least, we have the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, namely the uh, Institute for Sustainable Futures uh, with one scenario. And uh, this is the data that uh, we have used. I'll get to that in a second in more detail um, and also why we why we chose to, to use this data. Um, it's quite interesting from a from an applications perspective i would say uh let me just go to the the next slide where we have more details on that um because it's the only let's say uh, scientific institution standing among all these uh these other uh institutions that i just showed you um 
so what's the background of this data? Why did Selective uh, decide to use it uh, in our, you know, um, in our approach to this topic? So this was commissioned by the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance um, in a uh, or specifically aiming to produce sectoral pathways that are relevant to financial market participants. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? Um, I think most notably, it means that this or uh, the outcome yeah, of this one earth climate model um, <clears throat> basically gives you a lot of model outputs along something that financial market participants are very familiar with, with which is a, a JIX sectorial resolution. Yeah, So this is something that I think a lot of uh, webinar attendees can, uh, can relate to, probably use. Uh, on a daily uh, or at least a frequent basis. Um, it's, so it's really something that is kind of easily uh, understandable and ingestible for a lot of, you know, the uh, institutions that are part of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. Um, what are the outputs that we are provided with? So um, basically we get uh, Net Zero pathways, uh, which are aligned with a 1.5 degree temperature increase scenario uh, with no or limited overshoot. Um, what we get is for each of these sectors that you can see in the, in the bottom right box there, um, we get carbon intensities um, in uh, five-year increments. Um, and these are very sector specific. So for the real estate sector, you might have something like uh, carbon emissions per square kilometer, um, for the steel industry, you might have something like uh, carbon emissions uh, by ton of steel. So very sector-specific uh, intensities that are, I think, uh, very helpful if you are um, really drilling down on a specific sector and, um, you know, you can get, kind of get closer to uh, the ultimate uh, goal variable, so to speak, um, that is being used to, to measure uh, progress in that sector. But we also get scope one, two, and three emissions on an absolute basis in megatons of CO2 all the way out to 2050. And this is something from, you know, very personal uh, perspective that we are used to in the indexing world, yeah, that we are using in a lot of uh, indices that we construct, most notably, I think, uh, Paris aligned benchmarks. Um, so as I said, we get these outcomes for uh, 12 sectors that are further broken down into 16 subsectors. Um, and these are sectors that I would, uh, you know, very loosely describe as the high emitting sectors. Yeah. So you have uh, energy broken down into coal, coal, oil and gas. You have utilities again, broken down into different types of utilities. You have uh, agricultural, uh, agriculture, food and tobacco. You have forestry. Uh, and and then some more industries, most notably, I think the uh, aluminum, the steel industry as part of the materials block. Cement is also quite a high emitting um, and thus very important industry. And you have uh, the transport industry and also real estate. Yeah, so uh, quite an interesting breakdown, as I said, along uh, JIX dimensions that that we are familiar with. And if that's not enough for you, you also have uh, a geographic resolution built into that. Uh, namely, you will get all of this data, again, for each and every sector on a global level, so aggregated up on a global level, uh, on, a, on the level of the EU 27, but also on a, diff, uh, on, a, on a country level for all G20 members. Yeah, So it's incredibly granular and, you know, um, it's very accessible. You can download this data from, from the website of, uh, of the university or the Institute of Sustainable Futures. You're basically getting a big zip file with a lot of Excel files. And, you know, uh, uh, I, I guess most of the participants are... Um, uh, active in the financial sector, we love our Excel files. It's it's you know what we are used to. It's easy to, to drill down and uh, kind of get to work with them. And um, the data is also free of charge. We talked to the lead author um, of this of this study and of this model, and um, you know in our uh, in our aim to learn a little bit more about this, but uh, he also confirmed that this is uh, also free of charge, even in in a, a commercial use case. So overall accessibility, 
uh, is great. The the usability, I think, from our perspective, you know, as an uh, as a starter, basically, is 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 really great. Um, and this is why we settled on this uh, data point for the analysis that that we are going to show you in the in the next couple of slides. Um, obviously, uh, scenario choice and uh, model choice um, are very important parameters that, you know, I kind of gave you our reasoning, but there's a lot more reasoning that goes into a decision like that on an institutional level. So uh, please, you know, don't take our decision as uh, as a, you know, as a sign of we did this because this is the one and only scenario that is that is usable. I don't think that's the case. That's not a, a fair representation, but it's really, uh, let's say, um, you know, our decision was driven by how can we get started with scenarios um, and, and test their applicability in a portfolio context in the best way possible. And, and this was a super nice starting point for us. So let's get to uh, applications. And we want to cover uh, three things today, three use cases specifically. Um, number one is <clears throat> um, we we are thinking what ca how can we use this data yeah what is the first thing that comes to mind and uh, what we what we did is we tried to construct a bottom up net zero pathway for broad market portfolios yeah so what's the idea you have all these different sector portfolios you obviously have a sector classification for each country uh, for each company. Um, in your in your global market portfolio, for example. Um, so you can obviously um, assign and derive a kind of weighted average pathway um, for this portfolio, so to speak, in, in a bottom-up way, because you're assigning each and every company a, a separate pathway and you're aggregating it up to arrive at a pathway that is applicable uh, to the entire portfolio as a whole. Um, Contrast this with what we are doing in the usual context of climate benchmarks today, most notably, I think, PABs, Paris Aligned Benchmarks, and Climate Transition Benchmarks, where we take a decarbonization rate that is handed to us uh, via the, you know, the, the regulation. Of course, this rate is derived in a scientific way, and we'll get to uh, that derivation in a second. But it's rather what we are doing right now is rather a top-down approach where we take the 7% decarbonization requirement embedded in Paris Aligned Benchmarks and we apply that across the board uh, to our portfolio. So the interesting question for us was, okay, if we do this analysis um, and derive a bottom-up pathway, how does this look like in comparison yeah, to, to a 7% uh, decarbonization? And... So just to give you a schematic overview of you know uh, the 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 construction or the modeling exercise that we that we ran on our side, um, starting out with PABs again. What are we doing today in in Paris aligned benchmarks, also in climate transition benchmarks? Um, the seven percent figure that we use in PABs is also derived uh, in a in a scientific manner from an um, uh, international e uh, energy agency report, which basically specifies a carbon budget until two thousand fifty. That's also the case for our sector pathways. Um, it is then translated into a net zero pathway via the use of a model and a scenario by the International Energy Agency. And you're basically, you know, you're deriving a top-down decarbonization rate saying, if we look at the economy as a whole, um, this is what we need to do on average, in this case, between 2020 and 2030, I think, if I remember correctly, this is where the 7% comes from, to achieve um you know the goals of the of the paris agreement uh by 2050 in the sector pathway world in our bottom up modeling we also start with a global ghg emissions budget of uh roughly 400 gigatons until 2050 this is broken down into sector budgets um and in the next step it is modeled or the sector pathway specific decarbonization pathways are modeled for each sector. So what does each sector have to contribute and when? Um, and then what I and then we do what I said, we assign all companies in the index their, their respective sector pathways and we kind of aggregate it up 
uh, to, to achieve a pathway um, for the entire portfolio. Now, in terms of uh, the assumptions and challenges that are embedded in, in this approach, they might seem quite obvious when you when you kind of think through the, the different steps. Um, I mentioned earlier that pathways in the data set that we use and also in all the other data sets that I've shown you are only available for high emitting sectors, yeah? Um, so you basically have a certain fraction of your portfolio covered by a pathway that is available through this model and you need to make an assumption for the remaining sectors, yeah. For example, healthcare or technology. Yeah. What we have done uh, to keep things simple is we've assumed the PAB like seven percent reduction. But you can obviously um, um, play around with that figure. Yeah. There might also be um, uh, some evolution of this in the future, where pathways become available for more and more sectors, or you can derive pathways for a specific company in a more uh, granular fashion, but for now we have to kind of resort to uh, to this assumption that I mentioned. Um, and then uh, the second challenge is that you model out a pathway, and this pathway gives you basically a decarbonization profile of your portfolio uh, as of today until 2050. Um, it takes into account the sector exposure of the portfolio, something that uh, you know, PABs and using uh, a uniform 7% rate does not. But obviously there's a problem because you're deriving that bottom-up pathway today, but your sector exposure in a year might be completely different, yeah? Um, because prices have changed, maybe, uh, you know, the selection of companies in your in your broad portfolio has changed. So there, there, there's a certain trade-off embedded where, you know, you, you run this exercise and you're really diligent, um, and you set a pathway for your portfolio, a bottom-up pathway for your portfolio until 2050, but then next year um, things look different. So you kind of have to find the sweet spot um, in saying, you know, am I going to keep this pathway until 2050? That's probably one extreme. Um, am I going to change it every year? That's probably the other extreme. Uh, the middle of the road approach would be I'm going to derive the my decarbonization rates for the next five years based on this pathway or for the next two years. And then I'm going to, you know, to update my analysis and see if anything has has drifted uh, significantly and thus results in a in a different pathway. Okay, let's let's get to the uh, results, uh, which you can see here in this graph. So the blue line, uh, and this is indexed to to one hundred, is basically the PAB like seven percent reduction, and the green line is <clears throat> uh, our bottom up pathway. This is something or an analysis that is based on uh, Selective's global benchmark series, namely the developed markets large and mid cap uh, portfolio, which. Uh, uh, contains the 1,600 roughly uh, biggest companies across developed markets. And you can see that they are actually uh, quite similar. Um, PAB like 7% reduction a little bit steeper in the beginning, but flattening out uh, a little bit more towards the end um, and vice versa for uh, our sector pathway. There's different ways to, to analyze this result. Um, one might be okay. PAB like 7% reduction is actually quite good, yeah, um, uh, which I would agree to. Um, the reason is also um, that obviously, you know, the we are looking at a, at a global portfolio here um, and PAB like 7% reduction is also modeling the global economy. So the, the starting points are, you know, roughly the same. Um, which might be one reason why these why these uh, things look similar. Um, but um, we also have to come back to the assumptions and challenges that I mentioned in the beginning. Yeah, and we want to be quite transparent about that. There's obviously a, a large part of the portfolio that is not covered by a sector pathway um, and thus uh, takes the 7% uh, decarbonization rate. So if I take a lot of uh, companies in my portfolio and apply the PAB like 7% reduction to them, mix it together with the companies that have a sector pathway ascribed to them and aggregate it up, it's going to look very similar to the 7% you know, reduction pathway uh, just by means of, uh, of that effect. Yeah. 
and uh, maybe to to provide you uh, some figures around that. If we look at the weight of companies that are not covered by a sector pathway in our benchmark, this adds up to 80%. So it's uh, really quite significant. In other words, uh, only 20% uh, of companies in our uh, global markets portfolio or developed markets portfolio have a sector pathway um, ascribed to them. But, uh, and this is something that I think is also worth uh, to take away, um, if you look at the carbon intensities, um, only 50% uh, or this number reduces to 50%. Yeah, So 80% of the companies in terms of weight does not have a sector pathway. But if we look at the carbon intensity, this reduces to 50%. So 50% of the index uh, in terms of the carbon intensity is covered by a sector pathway. This is obviously because we are covering high emitting uh, industries. Um, and but there are still 50% remaining. Um, and this is probably, you know, something that that we would flag as uh, potential for improvement uh, in either the scenarios or the models or the outputs of these models, uh, but also in terms of the granularity um, of the data that and how we can apply it uh, in our context. Yeah. So this this uh, use case overall, I think, is super interesting, especially in the in the asset owner uh, space um, where. A, I mean, it was also commissioned by the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, uh, this data set. So this is already a first hint, but it's quite interesting if you're, you know, if you if you still have some holdings in, in these industries that are covered by sector pathway, um, you can run through this exercise and kind of analyze your portfolio in this way, being fully aware of the, of the limitations, obviously. Yeah, so there, there's still a lot of room uh, for improvement. And in terms of, um, you know, applicability of the data for this scenario. If we use a traffic light system, we would probably give this a, a, a yellow light. The second use case that we wanted to look at, um, and this is maybe the, the most obvious ones, uh, the most obvious one to everyone on the webinar, um, is using this to construct sector net zero indices, right? It's actually the most straightforward uh, use case. So we have uh, net zero sector pathways, meaning what each and every sector has to do. So first thing I can do with this is I can obviously apply it to my sector indices. Um, and this is what we did. The challenge from, I think, a product issuance perspective, also from uh, an index provider's perspective is which of these, uh, which of these industries is an, you know, an interesting use case. Yeah. Um, we don't get too much demand for oil and coal uh, benchmarks these days. Yeah. So uh, we kind of had to go through the list of sectors and, and, and have to see, okay, where can this data be helpful in addressing the challenges uh, of the sector? Um, which sector benchmarks are also in demand, uh, in, in demand um, and represent a reasonably large uh, part of the of financial markets yeah and the the one we ended up with was uh real estate uh transport i think would be would be another interesting use case um and what we did is we simply took the real estate um net zero sector pathway and used this pathway to inform the decarbonization goals of a global real estate index huh? um Let's look at, at the idea here. Um, and first of all, I think, you know, I've explained a little bit why real estate um, is interesting. It's obviously a large asset class. Uh, it's addressed in listed markets. So we can, we can use it in our, uh, we can address it in our indices. Buildings and their constructions accounted for roughly 39% of energy and process related emissions, CO2 emissions in 2018. Yeah. Um, so it's a huge chunk of, of, of the global kind of energy and process related um, GHG or CO2 emissions. 22% uh, of the carbon budget until 2050, I mentioned that figure is 400 gigatons, is allocated to the real estate sector. So um, real estate is um, 
one of the biggest emitters. It's one of the industries with the, uh, let's say, biggest challenges ahead in terms of decarbonization. But it's also at the same time, one of the sectors where it is often suggested, you know, to have the largest low cost climate change mitigation potential. Yeah. Um, simply by reducing energy demand. Uh, and if I say simply, that is a little simpler than it actually is. Yeah. But at, you know, uh, to put it a little bit, yeah, as I said, oversimplified, you what you have to do is simply reduce your energy demand. How do you heat and cool your buildings? And this can be done if the energy that is consumed is obviously um, created in a more sustainable way. Um, so there's huge potential for the for the real estate sector. And this makes it, a, a, you know, combined with the things I mentioned before, a really interesting use case. Um, and if you look at the bottom left, you can also see this, um, my, my remarks from a couple of minutes ago reflected in the emissions uh, profile of the sector. You see a large chunk of scope two emissions, which are the biggest challenge. So how do you uh, heat and cool your buildings? Yeah, what kind of electricity do you use? Um, and this is by far the biggest challenge for the real estate sector. And since we can break down um, the emissions pathway to net zero for real estate into scope one, two, and three emissions, um, we can make use of that and say, okay, we are going to address this challenge specifically, namely by um, implementing or incorporating into our index a specific goal for the reduction of scope two emission intensities. Yeah. And we can do the same thing for scope one emissions and scope three emissions. We have also done that. But the basic idea is um, address the challenges that, that the sector has, uh, leverage the granularity of the data to do so, and define specific goals for each category of emissions most notably uh, scope two. And you can see that we start out, you know, we define basically um, decarbonization rates um, for this global portfolio in five year increments. So from uh, 2019 to 2025, we have to reduce by 7.1%, then next five years by 12%. So you see the increase already there. Um, and then by 12.8% after that, uh, and from 2030 until 2035. Um, last but not least, we want to address uh, some baseline risks. Um, these are some considerations that we see as pretty much market standard in Europe, especially um, under under SFDR, uh, where you know certain aspects like good governance uh, just have to be considered if you're building these products. So we basically apply a baseline exclusion policy to this index as well, um, along PAB standards. Here you can see the uh, the construction methodology in a little bit more detail. We work with our partners at Global Property Research, uh, the real estate experts within Selective, and we use their GPR 250, basically the 250 largest and most liquid uh, real estate companies uh, in the world as a starting universe. And then we, um, we apply the exclusions that I uh, just described, basically the uh, Paris aligned benchmark exclusion policy uh, with norms and values based exclusions, activity based exclusions, and also exclusion of companies that violate EU environmental objectives. <clears throat> and then we get to uh, the decarbonization part, where, as I said, we have separate um, decarbonization objectives built into the benchmark design or into the optimizer. Um, for scope one, scope two, and scope three intensities. We also overweight companies committed uh, to uh, uh, with committed science-based science -based targets. And we also include um, a decarbonization rate aggregated on the scope one, two, plus three intensity uh, level. The reason why we did this is um, we want to keep the option open for clients to say, I like this framework, but I like my PABs as well. And if you want to follow the official PAB framework, what you could do is you would simply replace the 6.1% that you see here for scope one plus two plus three by 7%. You would be aligned uh, with uh, the PAB requirements, 
it would still allow you to address some of the of the uh, specific challenges for real estate um, by by keeping the individual targets, especially for scope two. Yeah, and then we have some tracking error considerations that are also uh, quite standard in the benchmarks we built. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the, there are certain, this is the, the basic framework and there are certain um, customizations that, you know, that can be added. Obviously, um, different clients have different exclusion policies, so these can be adjusted. Um, you could add an initial intensity reduction. Uh, forgot to mention that if you want to align with the PAB or CTB framework, you'd have to plug in an initial reduction of 30 uh, or 50%. Um, you can... Uh, plug in the 7% decarbonization. You can add more tilting towards companies um, that are reducing their emission intensities uh, in line with sector goals. So this is another use case. You can say, I have my um, net zero pathways. I know what companies or what the sector as a whole needs to do. And you can hold companies accountable to these decarbonization rates by comparing their own decarbonization rates to sector averages and assigning over and under weights. Yeah, it's a very simple algorithm, um, uh, just as an example. Um, how does this look like? Um, so you can see or you cannot see two lines on the screen. Um, the, the message is quite simple. Uh, the index is built to, to be in line or roughly in line with the, with the parent benchmark. Um, it is, uh, so it results in benchmark-like risk return characteristics. I emphasized a couple of them here on the slide. Um, the tracking error you can see with, with 80 basis points is, is quite reasonable, um, given, let's say, the number of, of steps that we incorporate in the methodology where you know we actually uh, deviate from, from the parent benchmark. Um, we increase uh, the weight of companies uh, with science-based targets on average, um, and that's the aggregate uh, weight by 3.3% uh, versus the benchmark. This average is uh, actually a little bit misleading as it's been a lot higher recently and obviously with more companies uh, signing up for the science-based targets initiatives. Um, these numbers have been higher for the most recent rebalancings and the decarbonization targets uh, uh, that we set um, on each individual level or each individual scope uh, are reached by this index 100% uh, plus of the time uh, throughout the index history. What does the plus mean? It simply means we, uh, in some instances, we we decarbonize a little bit more actually than, um, than what is required. So last, last use case, and this is going to be a quick one. I'm conscious of, of the time. Um, you can basically use what we have looked at so far and take the best out of it to still have some applications in, in broad portfolios, meaning you can refine existing net zero indices. Yeah. So what can we do? Um, we can set constraints for certain sectors. Yeah. Um, and if I say um, net zero indices, I'm usually referring to uh, to Paris aligned benchmarks, but of course it applies to to pretty much any benchmarks uh, benchmark with a decarbonization objective. You can say some of the industries uh, within my benchmark are now covered by granular sector pathways, and I can set specific decarbonization goals for these industries, and I can introduce these decarbonization goals as part of the index methodology, yeah? And actually require certain sectors to decarbonize faster. Um, you can identify transition leaders in quotation marks. This is what I mentioned uh, on the uh, second, on the previous slide, um, where you say, okay, I want to identify companies that are that are doing what they can or doing uh, you know that are performing above average in their industry. You now have the data in the form of uh, sectoral pathways. You know how fast companies within the steel or aluminum sector uh, should decarbonize, and you can compare companies' actual per performance over the past two, three, five years uh, against that benchmark. And you can you know 
for example, introduce a tilt uh, based on that. Yeah, it's not the most granular data because not every company um, necessarily needs or can be uh, compared uh, to you know a sector average, but it's one option that that this data provides. So you know, it's it, I think it's worth it's worth highlighting, and it's just an addition to the uh, to the playbook. So. The uh, initial question we asked was uh, whether this is PAB 2.0. Uh, and I think, you know, I'd be interested uh, to hear uh, your takes, obviously, on this. I think, you know, we've seen that some of the use cases are, um, you know, coming with certain limitations. Um, I would say the analysis that you have to carry out and the granularity that you have to apply in the methodology um, is obviously uh, you know, a little more complex when compared to, to Paris aligned benchmarks. And there's obviously, you know, no official EU label attached to this. So those are the arguments that would probably be a little bit more on the con side. Um, on the pro side, I think we see a, a really interesting and emerging class of data um, that are, that is, right now in some use cases already uh, very very usable and actionable um, for for clients that wish to use it um, we've seen that in the broad portfolio context there are some challenges and assumptions um, but nevertheless it already allows us to do you know on the sectoral level or on the level of enhancing existing uh, frameworks um, or pabs or ctbs uh, this data does quite a good job and and represents quite a did uh, a good uh, ad addition to the to the toolbook so pab 2.0 probably not yet yeah uh, i would i would think that pabs are probably still uh, going to stay uh, where they are but it's probably you know uh, a little bit complementary even uh, to pabs and trying to address uh, some of the of the challenges or just refine uh, existing pabs uh, a little bit more um, this is the end of the presentation already. Wow. Yeah. And uh, let me just quickly look at some of the Q&As we've received. I see that some people had to drop out already. Um, I just need to locate the Q&As here. <clears throat> um, So one question is, <clears throat> do the results that we've shown for our global portfolio um, here, let me go back here, do these results imply that the uh, our global benchmark series developed markets large and mid-cap index doesn't meet the minimum 7% year-on-year decarbonization criteria of PABs? That's right, yeah. Um, so... Um, if you were to, to follow this pathway that we've derived, uh, you would not be in line with the criteria, which is the required 7% uh, year on year from 2023 until 2030. After that, uh, you'd be in line again. Um, but the, the purpose of the uh, exercise is rather to find out what is the true or actual uh, decarbonization rate that should apply to my portfolio. And this is also the, you know, the, the intention behind it, um, because different portfolios can have very different sector exposures. And so it's, I think it's a very fair question to ask initially, why should portfolio A that has a much higher allocation to technology and healthcare um, have a or uh, why should you apply the same decarbonization rate to that portfolio as to a portfolio which is, you know, probably a little bit heavier uh, into into some of the industries that are covered by these pathways? Yeah, PABs, depending on you know how your benchmark portfolio is constructed, might do just that. The seven percent is used across the board, and so the intention of our, of this exercise was really to say, okay, how can we take account of of uh, of these different um, you know, exposures and is there something like a true uh, or accurate decarbonization rate? Obviously, what needs to be added is that this also depends quite a lot on uh, the scenario uh, that is underlying the data. Yeah. So if you are using a hothouse scenario, uh, your decarbonization 
requirement requirements might not be as high uh, as compared to when you're using a 1.5 uh, degree warming scenario, for example. Uh, going back to the Q and A's. Um, how are you deriving an issuer budget from the sector budget? Um, that's a good question. It's not uh, really, so we don't assign a carbon budget to any specific issuer. Um, the Basically the way the model works is that you have a global carbon budget and you um, determine what are the energy demands by different industries over time. And then you break down the global budget into the different sectoral budgets. And then for each and every sector, you say, how does that uh, budget need to be distributed over time in order to, to reach our goals, yeah? And then what you get, the outcome is essentially a, um, a emissions pathway for each and every sector. And what we do is we say, okay, this is company A, it's in the steel sector, so it is assigned the pathway of steel. Uh, company B is in the technology sector. Oh, we don't have a pathway for that. Let's use 7% decarbonization for that. So there's not really a budget on a company level that is assigned. Instead, it's implicitly assumed that each and every company within a given sector is subject to the decarbonization requirements um, that, are, that are dictated uh, by the pathway. Yeah. Um, Going back again to the Q&As. There's a question whether uh, this pathway that, that we are showing uh, here, the blue one, uh, the, the green one, excuse me, is, is realistic in the, in the face of, you know, a lot of news that we will hit uh, 1.5 degrees uh, quite soon. Um, obviously, uh, you know, there's no way uh, disputing that. Um, it's again, I, I think quite important to highlight that we are looking at certain scenarios here. These are not necessarily um, predictions of the future. Yeah. So basically the, the scenario that is underlying this analysis is a 1.5 degree scenario with no or limited overshoot, meaning we're not gonna uh, emit um, or only in a very limited way above the budget that is that is specified yeah for for the global economy until 2050 um and this this way we will reach uh, and, and this is the way we will reach uh, a below uh, 1.5 degree uh, uh temperature increase um and then the the scenario through the model kind of unpacks what needs to happen um um in certain industries to achieve that yeah it's by no means saying this is what will realistically happen, yeah? So if your view is that <clears throat> this is totally unrealistic, then probably a hothouse scenario is uh, is the is the more interesting choice, yeah? So this is always a little bit what I meant in the beginning where you need to focus really a lot on uh, model and scenario choice um, and dive into that. And there's a lot of technical details you can, you can dive into. Um, um, before you make a decision on the model, yeah. Okay, um, I think this is it. I'm also we're we're approaching the full hour. So um, once again, uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. I uh, really hope that this was a uh, an interesting introduction into uh, into our thinking, into you know to the emerging class of data. Uh, maybe we could get uh, some of you to, uh, you know, follow the links that we'll, that we'll provide in the slides and, and do a little bit of your own research. We've decided to do a little bit of building in public here. Yeah, I think that's how it's called in the, in the tech space. Yeah. Um, we spend some time thinking about this and we hope that, you know, we can, we can trigger maybe some interactions with with you out there um, to, to evolve that thinking, because as you could see, um, it's very concrete in, in, in some parts, but in other parts, you know, uh, we would also really love to, to kind of just get, you know, the, the view from the outside um, 
because it's it's I think definitely worth looking into. Very interesting topic, and but something that benefits from from you know uh, further discussion uh, quite a lot. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, today again, and uh, for the last final time. And uh, have a rest. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your days. Thank you.